Hello everybody and welcome back. This is now our second problem looking at a single population variance. One tail test, yes, but again, let's make sure that we can find that information for ourselves by reading through the problem. So again, I'm getting some economies of scale out of my problems here. We're extending a previous one where we had already done a test on the mean uh, of some population. Now we're going to look at the variance or standard deviation of that same uh, problem. So here we're looking at a local farmer that produces hay for the nearby ranchers. The hay is rolled into these 50 pound bales and sold by quantity. So when a rancher buys 100 bales of hay, they can expect to receive 5,000 pounds of hay. To ensure the cattle ranchers are getting what they expect, they take samples of 40 hay bales. So here that sounds like that might be a useful piece of information or sample size to test whether they're averaging 50 pounds. It's important that the bales be relatively consistent in size as well. So this is where it deviates a little bit from our problem in uh, module nine, because now we're talking about consistency, which is the variance. The historical population standard deviation is known to be 3.73, but this is considered to be too high. Okay, that's a bit of a clue as to what we might be doing. In response to this, an effort has been made to improve quality and reduce the variation in those weights. So we want it to be more consistent. The most recent batch had a sample weight of 51.2 and a standard deviation of 2.9. We'll use a 0.05 level of significance to determine whether the variance in the size of hay bale has been successfully reduced. So that last statement is really telling us exactly what we need to do. And again, similar to the previous problem, there's sometimes little bits of information that can be misleading, right? Where it's talking about an average and it's giving us a sample average. Those bits of information are useful if we're doing a test on the average. But given that what we want to be testing here is whether or not the variance has been successfully reduced, I can really ignore that information. Again, it can be a bit of a red herring, information that's given that can lead you to think that maybe I need to use that information. Otherwise, why was it given to me? It's given just to see whether or not you understand well enough what you're doing to ignore that useless information. Step one, formulate our test. Okay, so I have a null and I have an alternative hypothesis. I know I'm testing a variance, so I'm gonna set that up as a variance. And we wanna see whether or not it has been successfully reduced. So our historic level here has been 3.73. That was a standard deviation. I'm going to convert everything to a variance just because I find it makes life a little bit easier. It's not a requirement, but given that I've written this as a variance, I have to be consistent with how I'm writing my numbers and how I'm writing my notation. So to be consistent, I'm converting everything to a variance. My hypothesized value is 1391. And I want to perform a test to see if we have evidence to show that our variance is now less than 1391, that it's been successfully reduced. So I'm setting this up as a lower tail test so that if our evidence supports the null hypotheses, I have evidence to show that we failed that we have not successfully reduced the variance in the size or the weight of those hay bales. If our evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, now I have evidence to show that we have been successful. We have evidence to show that the variance is now less than that historical norm. Our test statistic, again, once we recognize that we're doing a test on variance, you know, as we go through these different problems, these different types of problems, you're building up this toolkit, right? All of these different tools that you know how to use. 
but you really have to remember when each tool is appropriate. So here I can see, okay, I'm doing a test on variance. I reach into my tool kit and the tool that I need right now is this chi-squared calculation because I have to recognize that when I'm doing a test on variance, I'm using the chi-square distribution. You don't want to reach into that toolkit, all of these different things that you've learned about, and pull out a t-statistic or a z-score because those are going to be the wrong tools for the problem and will certainly give you the wrong results. So when I reach into my toolkit, I reach for the chi-squared test and now I can put in my test, my, my, my sample values, my sample size is 40 minus 1, my sample standard deviation here, 2.99 squared, and my hypothesized value, 1391. I reach for my calculator, I have 39 times 2.99 squared divided by 1391, and that gives me a chi-squared value of 0 0.0, uh, sorry, 25.07. You know the routine now, right? We have our test statistic, we have our degrees of freedom, 40 minus 1 is 39. I can now scroll down to our chi-squared table, down, 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 down. I have 39 degrees of freedom. Now again, just like our T distribution, we lose some accuracy when we're using these tables. So scrolling down, I can see it goes by one unit at a time up until about 30, and then it's going five at a time, 35, 40, 45, 50. Well, I'm going to just choose the nearest value. I'll round it to the closest value, which for us is going to be 40. So yes, we do lose some accuracy when we're doing this by hand and we're using these tables, but that's the trade-off. Otherwise, we'd have huge, big distribution tables. Now I'm looking again for my test statistic, which was around 25, 25.07. And my test statistic, I can see, falls between these two numbers here, between 24 and 26. I'm going to follow those up. Oh, that's not what I want. I can follow those numbers up here. And, well, that gives me interesting numbers. It's not what I expect to have such a large probability. Now remember, these probabilities are upper tail probabilities. We're doing here a lower tail test. So remember, when I'm doing a lower tail test, the value that I want, my p-value, must come from the lower tail. So I have a chi-squared distribution that looks like this. We have our critical values, or those values that correspond with these approximate probabilities of 24.4 and 26.5. And those are giving us these huge probabilities. But remember, those are upper tail probabilities. So this value of 24.4, so that's, let's say that's here somewhere, 24.4. That's giving us an upper tail probability of 0.975. This is a lower tail test, right? So what we are interested in is actually the lower tail probability, which means that here I have an area of one minus 0.975, and so that's 0.025. So I don't actually care about any of that. Now I come down here again, and I'm looking at the next value is 26.5, and that corresponds to an area of 95. So 26, let's say that's over here somewhere. 
And that gives me an area again in that upper tail of 0.05. We're doing a lower tail test. I don't actually care about that upper tail probability. What I want is the lower tail probability, which is this region here, which would be one minus that, that was a mistake. This was 0.95 in that upper tail. And so what I'm interested in is the lower tail probability, which would be one minus the upper tail. Here's that 0.05 in that lower tail. Okay, so I can clean this up. And now I can look at, okay, well, my test statistic was 25.07. So if my test statistic is 25, here I am somewhere between those two values. Lower tail test, my probability of interest is in the lower tail. Here I can see, well, it's larger than that purple region. So my p-value is larger than 0.025, but my p-value is smaller than that blue region, which was 0.05. So that's a little bit tedious, I know because of how these tables are designed, because these tables are giving us only area or only values that correspond with area in the upper tail. So we have to think about when we're looking at this chi-square distribution, the values that we're being given, values in the upper tail, well, that will be some value that corresponds with alpha. So if we're looking at it, a critical value or a test statistic in that upper tail that's going to be defined as some critical value that corresponds with alpha in the upper tail. But when we're looking in the lower tail, these are going to be chi-squared 1 minus alpha, which means that it's this area here is that probability, one minus alpha, and that leaves us with that probability of interest in the lower tail. So the notation is a little bit different only because of how the tables are designed. So it makes it a little bit more tedious getting those lower tail probabilities, but hopefully this made sense. So we've got our p-value, our critical value, well again, we're doing this at a 05 level of significance. So we already know what that value is, but going to the tables, I want that level of significance alpha in my lower tail, right? I want it in my lower tail. So if this is the critical value that I'm looking for, well, it's the one that corresponds with one minus alpha. 1 minus alpha is 0.95, and so that's why I look for 0.95, because I'm looking at that lower tail value, and this is giving me upper tail probabilities. So I have 0.95 in the upper tail. That gives me this value of 26.5, and so just like all of the other tests that we've been doing. Let's get rid of all of this and this. Clean this up a little bit. That value, 26.5, that corresponds with that area, 0.05 in that lower tail. That defines our rejection region for a lower tail test and our do not reject region for that lower tail test. Here I can see my test statistic is in that rejection region. It is smaller than that critical value. And as we would expect, we see a consistent result 
using the p-value approach. My p-value is less than alpha. Alpha still represents my level of comfort towards committing a type 1 error. My exposure to committing a type 1 error is less than what I would be comfortable with. Both our p-value approach and our critical value approach are leading us to reject the null hypotheses. What does that mean? Well, here we have sufficient evidence to show that our effort to improve quality control and reduce the variation in weights has been successful. Notice when I'm interpreting my results, I've so often I'm stealing vocabulary and stealing words from the problem itself. And when I justify the formulation of my test, and I say at the very beginning, here's what we learn if the evidence supports the null, here's what we learn if the evidence supports the alternative, then I go through all of that exercise, all of those calculations. When I draw my final conclusion, I'm really just repeating what's already in the problem, and I'm repeating what I already said when I explained what it means if the evidence supports the alternative, right? I justified that. I said, here's what it means if the evidence supports the alternative. Now I'm saying, okay, the evidence does support the alternative. So again, here's what that means. Okay, so I hope that made sense. I hope that's pretty clear. Very similar process, small differences in the calculations. Here for this lower tail test, a little bit of a complication in reading those tables. Hopefully it's not insurmountable. Everybody should be getting pretty comfortable, I think, in reading these distribution tables. Okay, thanks for watching everybody. Bye-bye.